Hey everybody, thanks for joining White Dog Outdoors. We're in the middle of summer. All of our bigger streams are too warm to fish. So what's the perfect thing to do? Go looking for those cold mountain streams that are gonna hold wild trout. Today we're gonna to be talking about how we find these streams, how we can, what gear we're gonna use, and then how we're gonna be able to attack these streams to be able to be successful. Before we get started, just a couple of quick things. Number one, I wanna give a huge shout out to our new pack members. Thank you all so much for your support. Your support helps the work that we do, so I really appreciate it. If you're interested in joining the pack, I'll leave a link in the description below, and you can hit the join button on any of our videos. Um, it basically is exclusive content that I provide to members, and starting this fall, we're gonna be doing some live streams to be able to help answer members' questions and everything like that. So I hope you'll join us for the membership and throughout everything that we're doing. The next thing is, when we hit 25,000 subscribers, we're gonna be doing a huge giveaway. Um, there's going to be several prizes, but the grand prize is going to be a Diamondback Ideal Nymph fly rod. I cannot wait to give this away. These fly rods are absolutely amazing, so I hope you'll join us um, through the channel for everything that we're doing up and now and, and until we get to that giveaway. But hey, let's get into today's video. All right, so if we wanna find these streams, we have to make sure we're looking in the right places and we're gonna to have to do some work, all right? So the first thing I would do is I would start doing some research and planning. I would look at the natural resources sites for the areas that you're gonna be fishing and see what kind of information they provide for um, small stream native and wild trout populations. Um, they should give you a general idea of where to start. So we're typically looking for mountain streams. I live in the Northeast, so you have mountains all the way from North Carolina all the way up through to Maine, right? So that whole Appalachian uh, chain of mountains is going to be a great place to start, okay? Those streams are going to have elevation change, which is gonna create habitat. They're typically gonna be cooler, they're gonna be shaded. Um, and these are really great places for wild and native fish to live and thrive. So I would get out a map, take a look at the map and see where those mountains are. Look for little blue lines coming out of those mountains. This is why we call this blue lining. We're just driving around and finding blue lines and we're trying them out. Let me tell you what, it's a lot easier than you think it would be. <laughs> um, but grab those maps, look for those blue lines, drive out to them, and what you're gonna be looking for, I want you to take a, a stream thermometer out with you. Take a temperature of that stream in the middle of summer. If you're temping in the middle of summer at 65 degrees or below, that is a really good sign and a really good likelihood that you're gonna find some trout in those streams. All of the streams that I have around me, if they maintain a good temperature, they hold wild fish. And you would be surprised how many streams really hold fish. All right, so we, once we find these streams, the next thing I wanna talk about is safety. These streams are no joke. Um, the terrain in these streams can be really challenging. Um, they're really rugged areas. I'm typically climbing a mountain through a stream as I'm going and following these little streams. And you know, as you're walking through these mountain or these these streams, you're going to be hopping rocks, and eventually one of those rocks is going to move, and it, you're going to take a fall. Or there's going to be a slippery rock, and you don't know it, and you're going to take a fall. So I'm going to tell you right now, if you're going to go explore these streams, you need to be prepared for what that means. If you are not in great shape or um, if you don't have great footing, this may not be the type of thing that you should be doing. This is for young agile people and even old agile people, but as I get older, even I am taking additional precautions. So first of all, I wanna make sure that you have really good footwear. Do not come out on these streams in flip flops or sandals or sneakers or even hiking boots. I would really recommend that you use a good wading boot and neoprene socks. Um, I would not wear full waders. You're gonna get really hot in full waders in the middle of summer. Um, today, I'm actually wearing just a wader that goes from my hips down. Um, they're a nice little, um, they're like a Reddington lightweight uh, pant wader. Um, that works really, really well if I don't wanna get wet. I usually only do that if I'm carrying electronics in my pockets, otherwise, you're completely good to wet wade. I would just get a good pair of wading boots, get a pair of neoprene socks, 
and you're pretty much good to go. The other thing I would warn you is don't let your pant legs um, come out of those boots. Pull those socks right over those pant legs because um, I have taken some pretty good falls when my pant leg comes loose out of there and it wraps around my other foot and basically I basically tied my feet together and I'm, I'm taking a face plunge into the rocks and into the water. If you are a little bit older and you want to attempt this or if you're a little worried about um, being able to maneuver the streams, it's a good idea to bring a waiting staff. A waiting staff is going to give you a third point. It's really going to help stabilize you. I use waiting staffs on these streams sometimes and is also when I'm fishing like big pocket water type stuff. It's almost crucial in some of those situations. So if you're going to go out, consider at least taking a waiting staff. All right, when it comes to clothing, I am not going to wear shorts. I am not going to wear a t-shirt. I always wear long pants. I always wear a long shirt. A lot of times I'll wear a buff to cover my face. Um, there's a couple of things. When I'm hiking these streams, I'm not taking a paved path. I am bushwhacking through the woods. I'm climbing up and around things. I'm going through all sorts of crap. You're going to want long pants and long sleeves to protect you from the brush. And you're going to want those things also to protect you from the bugs because black flies, mosquitoes, ticks, they are everywhere and they're going to drive you absolutely nuts when you're on these streams. Long pants, long sleeves are going to help. You can wear a buff that comes up and around. Um, today I'm wearing a hoodie. Uh, it's like a little sun hoodie. I can pull this up over my head if I want and really kind of lock everything down. Um, by the way, I love this sun hoodie from uh, J.P. Ross Fly Rods. Best shirt I've ever owned. All right, so wear those long pants, wear those long sleeves, and when you get home, please do a tick check. I've been out on these streams, come home, and I found ticks embedded in me. You're out in the woods, it's gonna happen, all right? So biggest thing is make sure you're checking those. Don't let those ticks be in you for more than 24 hours. Make sure you're picking them off, okay? If you're gonna use bug sprays, um, definitely a good idea. I'd be careful of DEET. It does affect the, um, the leaders, the leader material that you use for fly fishing. So just be careful of what type of spray you're using. All right, when you are out here, it's going to be really hard to turn around because these streams are just so beautiful and so amazing that you just want to keep going. Um, what I usually do is I set myself a turnaround time. All right, if I want to be back by this time, I know that I'm going to give myself a little bit of leeway before dark. I'm going to make sure that I turn around at a certain point in time and I'm going to keep checking that. Um, you don't want to extend beyond that too much because you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're trying to come out of these mountains in the dark. The other thing is, make sure you tell somebody where you're going. If you're not going with somebody else, which to be completely honest, I fish most of these by myself. They are very dangerous places. I have taken several really bad falls. It's going to happen. So make sure somebody knows where you are. Um, I told my wife exactly where I was going to be today. And my entire family uses an app called Life360. Anybody, can, anybody in my family can see exactly where I am. And so if I were to not show up or come home, they know exactly where to find me. In fact, that dot will even tell them where on the stream I am. So I would definitely recommend something like that, but make sure somebody knows where you are. All right, so let's talk gear. Um, I'm a fly fisherman, so I, I, this is gonna be specific to fly fishing, but I think that the sweet spot for a small stream rod is a seven to a seven and a half foot, right around a three weight. Um, I like the whippiness of a three weight. It uh, makes feel, fighting these little fish feel really fun. Um, it's, they're long enough to be able to keep your line off the water. A lot of this is short range fishing. And so I don't want the currents affecting my drift. So a lot of times I'm holding my line up and I'm not letting it touch the water. That seven, seven and a half foot rod allows me to do that really well. A shorter six foot rod, you're just not gonna feel the same control, you're just not. Um, but I can still cast these if I have a really slow, long pull and I don't wanna spook anything. I can really cast these really far. They've got great feel to them. So, you know, my rod is a JP Ross uh, mirror glass. I absolutely love it, it is a glass rod. Um, they make them specifically for each customer. So if you're interested in a small stream rod, I would really highly recommend Go check out JP Ross. He's got the mirror glass. He's got the new S glass, which is, that's my next rod. That's gonna be a seven and a half foot. Um, but the character that they put into these rods is really just something amazing. And I feel like these small native streams with these wild and native trout, I just wanna have something that means something to me. And that's why I love these rods so much. So anyway, uh, check them out if, if you get a chance. But um, you know, I think that seven and a seven and a half foot 
three weight rod is really just about perfect for these streams. All right, when it comes to flies, first thing I wanna tell you guys, native wild trout are generally not picky at all. You can pretty much throw anything in front of them and they're gonna eat it. And the reason is they're living in a really small environment. They've had to learn to be very aggressive to be able to survive. If some piece of food is presenting itself, they typically aren't gonna think about it. They're gonna attack it, right? So you can use a lot of different kinds of flies. For me, most of the time that I'm on these streams, I'm dry fly fishing. Um, I'm, I'm doing these streams mostly from like June to September, and there's pretty good bug activity during those times, and the fish are typically looking up at uh, for, for bugs. And so I find I really only have to dry fly fish, which I, which I really love. Um, the flies that I use, I think there's a couple of really important things. Number one is I need it to float. Um, you're going to be fishing a lot of turbulent streams. There's going to be a lot of little pockets of white water and everything like that. I need something that's going to float really well. Um, you know, your typical cat scale dry flies, they're going to get waterlogged, they're going to get submerged really quick, and you're going to be putting on your dry fly floating like a million times throughout the day. It absolutely drives me nuts. I have gravitated to more foam-based flies. I used to do the foam caddis, which is still a really great fly. I have a fly tank, to, fly tank tutorial on the, on the channel. I'll link that down below. But the new one that I tie is basically it's a double layer foam. I didn't mean for it to be a, a hopper, but it really kind of looks like a hopper. So I guess really it's a hopper, but it's a double layer foam that really, really floats and it's really, really visible. So the second thing I need to make sure is that it's really visible. I need, I'm gonna be floating it through all these little white water pocket areas and I need to be able to see it. I want something that the fish can see and I want something that I can see. I'll go out fishing with other people and they'll use smaller flies and the fish just don't see them as well. And so I really like something that I can splat down on the water It makes a big disturbance and they say, oh my God, that's food and they attack it, right? So I typically really focus on those foam-based flies just because I think they perform really, really well. Other methods other than dry fly, you can do like a dry dropper. And so that's where I also use those, those foam flies because they float really well and they can support a dropper underneath. And so I'll typically just do a very small nymph or a wet fly underneath that dropper uh, or that dry fly. And that sometimes in deeper pools, it helps fish be able to see. They might not see the fly on top because it's so deep, um, but they'll see the nymph coming down below and they'll take it. And that dry fly will act as an indicator. So when they take the nymph, it pulls the dry under and you notice know set the hook. That's a really great method. Uh, those are kind of the two methods that I generally use dry dropper once in a while, mostly dry flies. The other thing I'll do is I'll, I'll throw streamers. Um, usually only in deep water. If there's some deep plunge pools where I don't think that the, I think there's fish down there, but I don't think they're looking up and seeing the fly. I'll put on like a jig streamer, a big bright jig streamer, and I'll cast it up into the head of the pool and I'll jig it down through. And it usually gets some pretty good activity and get some really big fish out of the bigger holes that way if they're not looking up. So those are the three methods that I typically use and the flies that I typically use with them. All right, so how are we gonna attack these streams? Okay, so the first thing to understand is that fish are gonna be facing upstream, right? They're gonna be looking into the current because that's where their food is coming from. They're built to hover into the current, you know, looking forward that food is gonna come down to them. So we are gonna go from, the downstream, from downstream to upstream. We're basically gonna be climbing the mountain as we fish. You stay behind these fish, and as long as you stay behind the fish, they're less likely to see you. If you were to go downstream, come from upstream to downstream, those fish are gonna see you so much easier, and it's gonna be so much harder to fish effectively. Uh, I would highly, highly recommend always go upstream when you're fishing. Follow these streams up into the mountains, okay? the level of stealth is going to be that you're going to need is going to be dependent on the type of water if you've got pocket water plunge pools the surface of that water is not very calm you're going to be able to get pretty close to these fish actually um, i'll walk right up to a pool if it's if it's like that as long as it's got some current it's you know the, the surface is not like a mirror glass i can get pretty close to them and i could just cast and you know my typical cast is maybe 10 12 feet maybe even less than that. Um, I usually don't have a lot of fly line out the rod. And 
you're very easy to catch fish in those situations. If I have a slow, really calm looking pool, that's where I'm gonna to have to take a more stealthy approach. I'm gonna to have to keep a low profile. I'm gonna get down, I'm gonna crawl up to the pool. I'm gonna to try to hide behind a rock as I cast, and I'm gonna make longer casts to be able to not spook those fish, right? So, you know, white water, you can get right up on the fish. If it's calm water, you're gonna to have to be a lot stealthier as you approach it. The one exception is if you're, if you're gonna throw streamers, um, that's typically, you're typically upstream and you're gonna be casting down and across. Um, you might have to make longer casts. It might be a little bit harder in small pocket water, um, but that is a situation where you can be upstream. You're just gonna have to be a lot stealthier about it. Uh, my preferred method is definitely to be behind the fish, casting upstream with a dry fly. All right, so as we're on the river and we're starting to move upstream, now, where should I be casting? Where should I be finding fish? Well, the first thing I'll say is in a small stream, you can find fish just about anywhere. It's pretty surprising sometimes where the fish will hold um, in some really skinny water. But in general, you're gonna find your better fish in the, in the better space places, right? So you're gonna look for things like a little bit more depth. You're gonna be looking for maybe a darker water, a, a deeper area. Look for submerged rocks. They love to hang out down below a submerged rock where they can stay safe, and then they'll jump, they'll scoot up and pick off a fly and head back down. Um, so those are great areas. Look along the edges of rocks. Um, if there's any down logs, um, you know, anything that's a little bit deeper, um, those are really good areas that are gonna hold fish. So as you're coming up to a, a pool, let's say it's a little bit longer spot. Yes, the best spot of that pool may be all the way up at the head of the pool where the water comes in, but don't go right to the head of the pool. Start at the tail of the pool and work your way up, right? There could be fish holding in the tail of that pool that you would have missed or you would have spooked if you'd just gone straight up to the head of the pool. Always work your way up methodically through a stretch. So when you're hitting a particular area, give a little flick, let that fly come down through. Maybe give it another one, pick different lines and just after a couple of casts, move up to the next area of that pool. So attack it from the tail up through the head of the pool, right? You're likely to find multiple fish throughout that pool. If you attack it that way, you'll be more successful going from the tail of the pool up to the head of the pool. I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they spend too much time on a piece of water. Um, that fish is really going to hit in the first cast or two generally um, every once in a while, it'll be maybe the third or fourth cast, but don't keep casting over and over again to the same spot. If you don't get a hit, move, right? Um, when I'm fishing alone, especially if I'm not filming, um, I will just cast, make a couple of flicks here and there. I'll move up through the pool, make a couple of casts, hit the head of the pool, make a couple of casts, and I'm, I'm on to the next spot. Um, you'll, it'll really be in your advantage to, I don't wanna say move quickly, because I want you to be careful but I don't want you spending too much time on a particular spot because I think you'll waste your time. Um, you'll find many, many more fish by giving it just a couple of drifts and moving up to the next spot. And as you're on that stream, as you're learning what the stream is gonna hold, always pay attention. The, the fisherman who's gonna be successful and the best fisherman is somebody who pays attention to what's going on. Did you get a fish in a deep spot? Did you get a fish in a shallow spot? Are you getting more than one fish in a pool? put those things all together to help you be successful throughout the day. All right, if we're out on these streams, you know, these are beautiful places. These are native and wild fish. And I just, I wanna respect the resource. Um, so a couple of things. Number one, I don't, I don't name streams. Um, I will not put a stream name on any video that I do uh, for these small streams. They're small, they just can't take the pressure. You get too many, if you set a stream name, you know, and everybody saw it, they'd be out here and the, the fish population could get hit pretty hard pretty quickly. Even if they're not keeping the fish, it's just not as healthy for them. So I, in particular, will not hit the same stream more than once every couple of months because I don't want to put too much pressure on the stream myself. Yeah, I think finding these streams is, is something that you earn. Um, and maybe you share it with a couple of close friends, but just you know, don't share it out on the internet and with a, uh, throughout the world because that stream is, is likely never gonna be the same after that. The next thing is you have to make sure that these streams are a certain temperature and below. If the stream is 65 and below, 
you're good to go, right? I prefer, you know, low 60s, high 50s, but if it's getting above 65 degrees, I may choose not to fish those fish. Anything above 67, I'm calling it quits. I am not gonna fish those fish if it's above 67. Um, they just don't tolerate heat well, and it, it affects their long-term survivability if we're catching them um, in water that is too warm. So 65 and below, you're good to go. The next thing is I use barbless hooks um, when I'm fishing these streams. It'd be, you'll be really surprised, even a little tiny barb, these fish are so small um, and they can be really delicate. Um, if you have a barb on a hook, even though it's a good hook, you may not be able to get it out without destroying that fish's mouth and you're gonna affect their survivability. Um, if you learn to fish appropriately and keep tension on your fish, you really won't lose many fish on a barbless hook. And so I really highly recommend use barbless hooks or pinch the barbs on your hooks. It'll make it so much easier on the fish. I've had fish that have swallowed the fly, they've engulfed the fly, and because I have a barbless hook, all I do is I, I just put my finger down, I poke it, and lift it out. It comes out so much easier. If I had barbs on my hooks, I am guarantee I would kill a lot of fish by accident. So barbless hooks will make a huge difference on the health of the fish. Another common mistake I see people do, and I see this when I'm guiding, is it's, it's tricky to, to learn how much power you need in your hook set. Um, typically, you don't need a big hook set. You're not bass fishing, right? You just need a little, honestly, your, your hook set is a little snap of the wrist. It's basically that. Um, it's not an arm motion. When I do an arm motion, I'm basically gonna, if it's a smaller fish, I'm gonna take that fish, I'm gonna pull him out of the water and off he goes, right? And hopefully he stays hooked so you can catch him. But I always keep a short amount of line out and I do a, a short hook set. Just a short, quick hook set is all you need. If I lose a fish, whatever, I don't care. I'm not gonna give it the big hook set. Um, I've actually had clients set the hook on a fish too hard, the fish goes flying around, hits a rock behind us and the fish is dead. Um, you know, sometimes it does happen. They're small fish and they come out of the water. I use a very short line when I'm fishing. So if that happens, I just lift my rod in the air. They never hit the ground behind me and they just float back and, and I place them back in the water in front of me. If I had a lot of line out and I did a big hook set, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I generally fish short line, just a little snap of the wrist on the hook set is really all you need. And a couple of handling tips. Number one, I generally am using um, a landing net. Um, if I want any kind of picture, I'm going to use a landing net. Um, I'll scoop the fish into the net and I'll just leave them in the water until I get ready to unhook them. Um, typically, you're not fighting a, a little native trout or a wild trout for very long um, because you're in small streams, there's not any place for them to fight. But if it's a bigger fish, the fight is a little bit longer, just leave them in the net, leave them in the water, let them recover a little bit. Hopefully, you've used that barbless hook and you can unhook that fish very easily. If you want to grab a picture, what I do is I'll leave the fish in the net. I'll put one hand under the fish. I always wet my hand before I touch the fish so that I don't remove the slime coating. The slime coating helps protect them from disease and infection. So I'll wet my hand, I'll slide it under the fish, I'll get my phone ready, I'll lift that fish up, and I'll take my pictures and put it back in the net. I don't pull it way up here. I'm not carrying them around. That fish is in the water until I'm ready to take the picture. When I lift it up, he's over the net so that if he flops, he's just gonna go right back into the net. If he starts flopping, I just lower him down right? Get a little control, bring him back up. That fish shouldn't be out of the water for more than a few seconds at a time. I'm going to get a couple of good pictures. I do like to hold them up just a little bit more, get some of the background of the picture, but I'm really only two feet off the ground still, and I'm over the water, and I'm over the net. If something starts to flop, I'm just going to bring him back down, and he's going to be safe, and he's not going to be hitting the rocks. All right, well, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I think small stream fishing can be just about some of the most fun you can have. You are going to be in beautiful, incredible places, um, and hopefully you're gonna be finding native and wild trout that are just absolutely beautiful. And I just, I think that these streams are just incredible to explore. So I hope that you guys can be successful. You can find some streams for yourselves. And uh, again, treat these fish with respect, but thank you so much for joining us. Again, remember, we're gonna be doing the 25,000 subscriber giveaway. So make sure you're following along for all of that. And hey, we will see you soon for our next adventure.